Welcome to 6 NDA. I'm Chao Wei Huang of the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and of the Frederick Health Hospital. Today's case is a case of large coronary aneurysm in a STEMI patient. Our patient is a 70-year-old woman with hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and PAD. She had not been feeling well since yesterday. This morning, uh, while having a bowel movement, she developed 10 out of 10 substernal chest pain and called EMS. In the ER, her blood pressure was 95 over 65. She was in severe distress. She was diaphoretic. She was ashen. The ECG showed sinus rhythm with 5 millimeters of anterolateral ST elevations. The STEMI team was activated, and she received aspirin, ticagrelor, and a heparin bolus. She was then referred for emergency coronary angiography and PCI. On diagnostic angiogram, the LED is 100% occluded, and you'll notice that there is evidence of swelling contrast here in the proximal LED. There's a moderate disease in the proximal circumflex artery here as well. Here in the spider view, uh, you can actually more clearly see evidence of what looks like an aneurysm uh, in the proximal LED, uh, but with the LED unfortunately occluded somewhere uh, after the aneurysm. In this shot, uh, you see that the circumflex has uh, some moderate disease. And you also see uh, the remainder of the LED exiting uh, from uh, the uh, proximal uh, LED aneurysm. Uh, at this point, uh, you probably come to the frightening realization uh, that this is going to be a doozy of a case. Um, this is a patient with an enterolateral STEMI, and uh, you need to find a way of uh, quickly uh, finding uh, the outflow of the aneurysm and wiring the LED. One way to think about this problem is to approach it like if you were trying to engage the side branch of a very large blood vessel. The first thing that you would do uh, is uh, modify the guide wire tip. Uh, you want to give it a uh, very large uh, radius of curvature so that it has enough reach uh, to engage uh, the outflow of the aneurysm, or in the case of a large blood vessel, the side branch that you're trying to get into. If the uh, curve is too small, uh, the, um, uh, there simply won't be enough reach uh, to engage the wire into the outflow of the aneurysm. The second thing that you can do is to uh, change the base of operations uh, by positioning a microcatheter in the body of the aneurysm. Uh, that allows you to bring uh, the wire uh, closer to the wall of the aneurysm, uh, giving it more likelihood uh, to engage uh, the outflow. Uh, the other thing that uh, uh, you can po uh, potentially do is actually inject contrast uh, into the aneurysm, uh, and that allows you uh, to better clarify uh, the course of the outflow. Uh, contrast injection uh, can be done through microcatheters, although I do find that the lumen within thrombectomy catheters, uh, such as the priority one, uh, gives you uh, a, uh, 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 the, uh, the capacity to inject a, a more contrast. Another option is to uh, reach for uh, specialty microcatheters. Uh, in this scenario, uh, an angle microcatheter, uh, like the supercross line of microcatheters, uh, can be very useful. Uh, a venture catheter, uh, is, uh, which is a uh, microcatheter with an adjustable tip, uh, would be, uh, could potentially be useful as well. In our case, uh, our workhorse BMW wire uh, could not find the exit of the aneurysm. So we advanced a, a supercross microcatheter uh, into uh, the uh, body of the aneurysm and reshaped our wire uh, with a larger uh, radius of curvature in the hopes of engaging the mouth of the aneurysm. But nevertheless, uh, with the uh, supercross microcatheter in the body of the aneurysm um, with a, a, and a larger curve on our workhorse wire, we were still not able to get the wire to hook into uh, the exit of the aneurysm. We then exchanged uh, the uh, supercross microcatheter into a 90 degree angle microcatheter and manipulated the tip of the microcatheter uh, closer to the mouth of the uh, exit. 
Now with the tip of the microcatheter positioned near the exit of the aneurysm, uh, we were able to pass the BMW into the LAD more distally. However, the BMW wire got stuck here and could not be advanced any further. Also, the uh, vessel course is completely unclear and the direction of the wire is somewhat unusual uh, going uh, northward like this. We uh, injected uh, some contrast uh, into the microcatheter and uh, confirmed that uh, the wire was indeed intraluminal. Uh, the occlusion appeared fairly blunt and there clearly was some uh, mobile thrombus uh, within, uh, within the blood vessel. To try to get through uh, the occlusion, uh, we switched out to a hydrophilic pilot 50 wire um, and also switched to a straight microcatheter. Uh, but despite using the hydrophilic wire uh, with microcatheter support, the uh, occlusion still could not be crossed and the hydrophilic wire kept curv curving up uh, uh, within the blood vessel. At this point, we actually began to wonder whether this might actually be a CTO and that the culprit is actually the right coronary artery, which had been providing right to left collaterals. So we went ahead and got access uh, into the uh, contralateral groin and uh, shot an angiogram of the RCA. And you see that the RCA is a small, uh, vessel, relatively small vessel with a moderate disease, but importantly, uh, there were no appreciable right to left collaterals, again, suggesting that the lesion in the LED was the acute lesion and not a CTO. So we went back to the LED. Uh, we switched out to a Pilot 200 wire, a heavier uh, hydrophilic wire, and uh, um, uh, also used a turnpike microcatheter. And finally, with that, we were able to cross uh, the, uh, the occlusion. Uh, but again, the, uh, the course of the vessel was entirely unclear. The vessel was very tortuous. In this case, uh, there was no uh, contralateral uh, collaterals uh, to be able to help uh, with visualization of uh, the uh, distal LED. We did another microcatheter injection of contrast and uh, demonstrated that we were still intraluminal. Uh, the LED was clearly full of thrombus, um, and so we decided uh, to start a uh, GP2B3 inhibitor infusion. Uh, with a lot of effort, uh, we were in eventually able to wire uh, the LED more distally. Uh, it did feel free, uh, and it was uh, freely engaging all of the side branches. Um, a proximal injection, uh, again, demonstrated uh, the very large size of the proximal LED aneurysm uh, with, a, uh, uh, with a stenosis both prior uh, of the aneurysm as well as the severe diffuse disease distal to it. Uh, at this point, the distal vessel still uh, did not uh, opacify. We performed contrast injection through the microcatheter and finally were able to demonstrate uh, the remainder of the LED. Given the uh, abundant amount of thrombus, uh, at this point we were uh, considering whether to actually perform aspiration thrombectomy. Now, the recommendation for aspiration thrombectomy uh, comes primarily from the TOTAL trial, uh, which was published uh, in the New England Journal in 2015. Uh, in the trial, uh, over 10,000 STEMI patients uh, were uh, randomized to either PCI alone or aspiration thrombectomy, and the trial was overall a negative trial. Uh, there, was, uh, no reduction, uh, there was no reduction in MACE. Uh, between PCI versus thrombectomy, and actually uh, that there was uh, uh, evidence of an increase in stroke rate um, uh, within 30 days. Um, and so the recommendation um, is that uh, routine aspiration thrombectomy before primary PCI is actually not useful uh, with no benefit, and with a weak recommendation uh, for aspiration thrombectomy in selective cases uh, for uh, bailout uh, situations. Now, if you're going to go ahead and do aspiration thrombectomy, there are several options uh, that you have available. Um, uh, the uh, simplest way to do it is uh, with one of the uh, uh, number of uh, aspiration thrombectomy devices. Uh, there is also the uh, penumbra, uh, which is a uh, aspiration catheter uh, that's connected to an outside engine uh, that provides a, a vacuum uh, to uh, uh, aspirate out uh, the uh, thrombus. Now, if the thrombus burden is particularly high, uh, you may want to consider using rheolytic thrombectomy using the angiojet system. 
uh, in the Enderjet system, uh, the, uh, there are uh, sailing jets uh, that travel backwards at a very high speed that essentially creates a negative pressure zone and a vacuum that uh, pulls out the blood clot. Unfortunately, the data for Enderjet uh, is not particularly great. Uh, in the AMI trial from 2004, there was actually a harm and mortality uh, associated with the device. Uh, jet stent, then a few years later, was more neutral, uh, was showing uh, some uh, benefit uh, for uh, ST segment uh, resolution, uh, but uh, no significant benefit uh, for scar size uh, reduction. Um, if you're going to do Androjet, uh, we uh, uh, typically recommend uh, placing a temporary pacer uh, prior to the procedure, uh, as patients often get uh, quite bradycardic uh, during the procedure. Uh, lastly, uh, you may consider uh, using a mechanical thrombectomy uh, devices uh, and stent retriever devices. These are mostly used uh, in uh, neuro interventions, although there have been reports of, uh, for instance, the uh, Medtronic solitaire stent retriever system uh, being used uh, uh, off-label uh, in the coronary artery. Going back uh, to our uh, patient, uh, this patient clearly had a very high uh, thrombus burden, so we decided to perform aspiration thrombectomy, uh, and we use our uh, priority one uh, aspiration thrombectomy catheter. Um, after thrombectomy, uh, we performed uh, balloon angioplasty. Uh, we chose a, a 2.0 by 20 millimeter compliant balloon, intentionally keeping the diameter relatively small uh, so uh, to minimize a distal embolization uh, from thrombus uh, being knocked loose. Uh, we were able to get uh, TIMI 2 to 3 flow uh, after balloon angioplasty. Uh, however, you see that the entirety of the LED is diseased. Uh, there is, again, the aneurysm in the proximal LED, but there is ectasia and severe disease throughout the proximal and mid LED as well. We deployed a 3.5 by 30 millimeter stent in the mid LED, but unfortunately in doing so, lost uh, the distal LED with no reflow, uh, probably from uh, thrombus uh, embolization. Uh, the patient uh, shortly after uh, this angiogram uh, developed VT and then followed by ventricular fibrillation. Uh, he required two shocks and a brief round of chest compressions uh, before uh, uh, achieving uh, ROSC. Uh, he actually uh, never uh, lost consciousness. Now, no reflow is unfortunately all too common uh, in either vein graft interventions or interventions in highly thrombotic uh, uh, coronary arteries. Uh, typically, uh, one would uh, uh, administer intracoronary uh, adenosine uh, or a calcium channel blocker such as nicardipine and verapamil. Um, I'm actually quite fond of using uh, uh, intracoronary uh, nipride. Uh, typically, we use a 50 microgram bolus followed uh, by uh, intermittent pushes of uh, 100 micrograms. I find that works uh, quite well. Intracoronary uh, nitroglycerin, uh, which is often used, is actually usually not particularly effective. Um, uh, you should also consider infusing the medications via a microcatheter or via uh, a thrombectomy catheter uh, to be able to get more distally within the coronary artery. Um, bail out the aspiration thrombectomy to try to uh, aspirate out the uh, thrombus or POBA uh, can also be performed. In our case, we administered a cocktail of uh, intracoronary nicardipine and nipride, as well as performed a limited aspiration thrombectomy. And with that, um, we were able to restore flow uh, to the distal LED. The question is now what to do uh, with uh, the uh, proximal LED, uh, including the sectatic area here and the aneurysmal area um, uh, at top. So how does one think about uh, coronary aneurysms? Well, there's three possible types in general. Uh, there are atherosclerotic uh, coronary aneurysms. Uh, there are coronary aneurysm uh, arising from inflammatory processes, such as from uh, Kawasaki disease. And there are also non-inflammatory uh, etiologies, uh, such as in the fibromuscular dysplasia. Uh, there are two general uh, categories of aneurysms, uh, including the uh, saccular aneurysm, like a bag, uh, a balloon uh, coming out of the um, uh, uh, side of the coronary artery, as well as more fusiform 
uh, 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 shape. Uh, in general, we define an aneurysm to have a diameter that is greater than one and a half times the diameter of the adjacent normal vessel segment. Giant aneurysms have over four times the diameter or, um, or a diameter of greater than two centimeters. And unfortunately, there isn't really a lot of data uh, for, man for the management of uh, coronary aneurysm. In general, uh, if the uh, patient is asymptomatic, uh, treatment uh, is uh, uh, going to be uh, conservative. Uh, that uh, uh, usually means aspirin or DAPT uh, often used, but again, there's a paucity of data. There is some limited data that suggests that anticoagulation with warfarin uh, is beneficial for uh, people with Kawasaki disease. Uh, statins are generally suggested uh, for their pleiotropic anti-inflammatory effects. If the patient is symptomatic, or if the patient is presenting an ACS, or uh, if uh, it's uh, a giant aneurysm or one that involves a left main uh, proximal LED or one that actually compresses uh, adjacent structures, uh, then uh, intervention uh, could be considered. Uh, emergency surgery uh, would be considered in the case of uh, rupture or near rupture as well as mechanical complication, and the PCI can be considered uh, in other cases. Uh, there really isn't any data for what the best PCI strategy uh, should be. In general, the thinking is that uh, if you are in a large branch uh, away from a bifurcation, uh, then excluding uh, the aneurysm with a covered stent uh, is something that could be considered. Uh, if it is a saccular aneurysm at a bifurcation, uh, then a stent-assisted coil embolization procedure uh, could be considered. Um, uh, in cases with a lot of thrombus, uh, a GP2B3A inhibitor infusion, as well as thrombectomy, uh, could be considered as well. Uh, Post-PCI, um, long-term uh, DAPT uh, is uh, suggested. In our case, uh, we went ahead and proceeded to stent the proximal and mid LED uh, with overlapping 4.5 by 12 millimeter and 4.0 by 38 millimeter drug loading stents. Uh, we uh, considered using covered stents, uh, but uh, the covered stent in the larger, uh, larger sizes were actually not available. Um, and um, moreover, the osteolocation of the uh, lesion in the LED uh, makes a placement of a covered stent uh, sub, uh, suboptimal. Uh, after the stent was deployed, we performed a very gentle post dilation uh, to avoid um, uh, further uh, thrombus embolization, given that patient uh, just arrested uh, with no reflow. And here is the uh, final angiographic result that uh, we do have TIMI3 flow, and the angiographic appearance uh, is uh, reasonably satisfactory uh, considering how uh, the patient presented. Uh, the uh, patient uh, was uh, placed on an infusion of a GP2B3 inhibitor for 18 hours, uh, and uh, we uh, recommended the prolonged uh, dual antiplatelet uh, therapy. Uh, the next day, echocardiogram uh, showed uh, ejection fraction of 25% with a severe anterior apical hypokinesis. Uh, the remainder of his hospital course was actually relatively uneventful, and uh, he was discharged home on hospital day four. So what are the take-home messages? Well, uh, several points. Number one, um, finding the outflow of a uh, large coronary aneurysm. The way to think about this uh, is to think about uh, the same way you would approach uh, trying to engage a side branch uh, 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 of, a, uh, of a very large blood vessel. You want to think about modifying the shape of the guide wire to give it a larger radius of curvature. Uh, you want to think about changing uh, your base of operations using a microcatheter and posi positioning that within the body of the aneurysm and the use of uh, specialty uh, angle microcatheters such as the uh, Supercross 90 or Supercross 120 uh, can uh, sometimes be useful in engaging uh, the exit of the aneurysm. Uh, we ran into a highly uh, thrombotic lesion, and uh, 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 the things to think about here are uh, whether or not to perform thrombectomy. Again, routine thrombectomy is not recommended, but can be considered uh, in highly thrombotic lesions and for a bailout. Uh, you want to try to avoid no reflow. Uh, so uh, post study very gently and uh, don't oversize. If you do get no reflow, uh, typically we use adenosine, nicardipine, or nipride uh, as an intracoronary injection. Um, uh, nitroglycerin is usually not effective. 
uh, for management of coronary aneurysms. Unfortunately, there isn't a lot of data, uh, but in general, uh, the treatment is uh, conservative unless the patient is symptomatic or presented, presenting as an acute coronary syndrome. All right, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, uh, please subscribe to our channel. Thank you.